Well, good morning, and today is Monday, and we are going to be starting in a series of epistles written by one of my favorite theologians. As a matter of fact, his name is called John the Theologian, and we know him as the Apostle John. Now, John not only wrote the Gospel of John, but he also wrote three epistles and the book of Revelation. So, <clears throat> John is rather important for us to take a look at this morning. So, we're looking at the epistle of 1 John. This epistle was written somewhere in between 80 and 95 AD. We're not sure the exact time and we're not sure the exact place. Um, we do know that maybe it was written while John was in Asia Minor in Ephesus ministering to people. <clears throat> However, we can't determine any of that with certainty. So the theme of John, <clears throat> there was a, a small heresy that was already starting at the time of the Apostle John, and this was called Gnosticism. The Greek word gnosis means knowledge, and this cult group called Gnosticism <clears throat> is talking about a hidden knowledge. So it was a group that was saying that they basically had the inside scoop as to who Jesus was, what went on with him, all of those things. Uh, what they did do is they thought all matter was evil, and the only pure thing was the spirit. And if that's the case, then Jesus' incarnation was a problem because his body would be evil, and it was his divine spirit that would be pure. So Gnosticism, the group of Gnostics, we call them, they were teaching that Jesus didn't have a real material body, that he had a spirit body. <clears throat> now, that teaching is the same teaching that we find today with um other cult groups like Jehovah Witness and so forth. But this, so the teaching hasn't really disappeared, even though the church dealt with it very early on. John is dealing with it right here in this epistle. He's going to defend the incarnation, defend the fact that Jesus is fully God and fully man in one body. He's going to continue to defend this teaching because that's what the church believes and what we stand on. So <clears throat> John is going to take a look at that for us. Uh, he's going to acknowledge who the Lord is and acknowledge what we believe about him in some very interesting terms. So you and I are going to get into that a little bit this morning. Why don't we open with a word of prayer and begin? Lord, thank you for giving us this rest this weekend that we could gather together this morning, um, once again, sitting at your feet and asking you to teach us through your Holy Spirit that you would guide us, give us wisdom, show us in your word what we are to do and to believe. And Lord, help us today to glorify you in all that we say and all that we do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you would look with me at the first chapter in the first epistle of John, beginning at the first verse. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, concerning the word of life. Now, <clears throat> just the very beginning here in, in that verse, he's making some profound statements to go against the Gnostics, to go against the idea that Jesus' body was not real but just the spirit. If you notice, he says that which was from the beginning, acknowledging Jesus is God, right? His existence is from the beginning. That which we have heard, 
so he had a real mouth and a real voice. That which we've seen with our eyes, I'm an eyewitness, in other words, which we have looked upon, because he was standing right in front of us, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. Our hands have touched him. He's physical body. He's not a spirit body. He's a physical body. So our hands have handled concerning the word of life. And he used the phrase word. He's talking about Jesus, but he calls him the word of life. So that which was from the beginning, it almost, it almost begins like Genesis. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. Now we have that which was from the beginning, which we've heard, seen with our eyes, looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. So there's a kind of a parallel with the first chapter of Genesis. And John is saying this specifically to say Jesus is not only physically a man, but he's also eternal. And the word of life. He's God. So John defends all that in just the first verse. Verse 2. The life was manifested. And we have seen and bear witness. And declare to you that eternal life. Which was with the Father. And was manifested to us. Manifested meaning born. Meaning visible right in front of our face. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you. And that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. So he's, he's defending the fact that Jesus is a human being. He was manifest, born. He's the word of life and eternal. And yet, he was with us. We've seen, heard, and handled him, touched him. So there's no getting around the defense that John is giving. Verse 4, and these things we write to you that your joy may be full. Notice how he ends that little section, that your joy may be full. I'm writing this to you, beloved, so you don't get caught up in this error that they're teaching you, these Gnostics. I'm telling you who he is. He's who you always believed he was. And I'm giving you confirmation right now so that you can rejoice. Your joy is well placed. It is well placed in the beloved and in who he is. Amen. Now look at verse 5. He's going to talk about, you know, and if we have fellowship with God through Christ, then we have fellowship with one another. Verse 5, this is the message, he says. That which we have heard from him and we declare to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Now, again, here John is giving you something pretty powerful. It's what we would call dogmatic, right? So John is saying, the message we've heard from him, we're declaring to you. God is light, and in him there's no darkness. Remember, the Gnostics were saying in the secret, you know, we have a secret about Jesus, and we can tell you the true knowledge about Jesus, and the true knowledge he departs, but it's secret, and it's a knowledge that you, we can reveal to you in time in the in the back room of our sanctuary here, you know, if you're found worthy. So what does John do? He's exposing that also. He's saying to him, look, the message we've heard from him and declare to you, that God's light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet we're in the back room in the darkness doing things we shouldn't, pretending we have secret knowledge, then we lie and we're not practicing the truth. Essentially, John's calling them liars. <clears throat> and he has no problem with doing that. Verse 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another. 
And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You see, the Christian faith is open before all people. We don't hide. We don't hide in back rooms, in dark corners. We don't have special secret knowledge that we only give to each other and nobody else. Um, we fellowship with one another out in the open. We do that because truth is truth. And we're not afraid of error. We expose error with light. Because God is light. And there is no darkness or error with him. And he says, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, if we're open and plain before all people and we proclaim truth and we live our lives openly, then we have fellowship with each other. Then we know that you, everyone else who does that is my brother or sister. And we know it's because the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. This is the redemption we have in Jesus through his blood. And where was that blood shed? On the cross. Now, I don't know about you, beloved, whether there's ever been a time where you have sat before him, our Lord, and you have said, Lord, I believe you died on the cross for me. You paid in my sin debt in full. I ask you to wash me and cleanse me in your blood. Forgive my sin and help me to live a new life. Dwell in me. When you say something like that, you're acknowledging the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, that cleanses us from all sin. All sin. Not a few here and there. Not a couple big ones you did when you were young. Or all sin is cleansed. I don't know about you, but that's good news. <laughs> it's good news to me. I thank the Lord for his precious blood. <clears throat> Verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. You know, then there are those who say, well, the Lord cleansed me of all sin because I believe in him uh, and I don't have any more sin. As a matter of fact, I don't sin at all. Well, I have a problem with that and so did John, right? The blood of our Lord cleanses us from all sin, but... We are sinners. We still do sin while we're living this life in this world. And what we have to do is we have to seek him for more cleansing, right? Each day we kind of confess to the Lord our sin. He's faithful and just to cleanse us of our sin. John's going to say that. And this is one of my favorite verses. So <clears throat> he cleanses. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. This is verse 8. You cannot walk around saying that you are not a sinner. Because, let me tell you, just between you, me, and the lamppost, you are. And so am I. Look at verse 9, though. Here's our hope. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I call verse 9 of 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, I call this verse the Christian's bar of soap. This is the Christian's bar of soap right here. If we confess our sins, and believe me, we need to. Every day we sin in one way or another, I'm sure. Whether in thought, word, or deed, we do something that transgresses. And if we do, we don't have to despair. We can go before God and confess it. Lord, I, 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 I repent. I'm sorry for treating so-and-so the way I did today or saying what I did to them that really hurt them. Lord God, forgive me for that. And if you truly repent from your heart and confess your sins, what does it say? It says, he is faithful and just. He is. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And here's the bar of soap. And to cleanse us from 
all unrighteousness, not some, not a few things here and there, all unrighteousness. So listen to me, beloved, when you fall, when you sin, when you do something wrong, I always tell people, keep short accounts with God. Bring it before him immediately and confess it. And the Christian bar of soap will cleanse you. The Lord will cleanse you. He'll hear you. He's faithful and just. And he will cleanse you from all sin and all unrighteousness. So keep short accounts with God. Always bring these things before him and ask him to forgive you every time you mess up. And he will. That's his promise. That's my God. And that's your God. Beautiful. Verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Yeah, don't say that. Don't say that you have not sinned or that you don't sin anymore. You do. We all do. <clears throat> Believe it or not, there are those who say they don't. Chapter 2, verse 1, my little children. Now you, you hear John's affectionate term, right? Um, as, a, as a minister, as an overseer, as one who has been appointed as an apostle, right? His pastoral heart comes out and he says, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. Now, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He's righteous, we're not. So he's saying, you know, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. In other words, I'm giving you the teachings you need to try to live a godly, holy life. So you can know good from evil, light from darkness, right from wrong, okay? So he's giving you the knowledge to be applied so that you don't sin or at least don't sin as much. But he acknowledges if anyone sins, which we will inevitably, don't worry, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, he calls him, because his righteousness gives him the authority to cleanse us from all sin. So if we do, we have an advocate, one who goes before us, one who goes in our stead and pleads our case. That's Jesus. So we do have an advocate with the Father all the time. One who is faithful and just, he just said. Verse 2, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins. The word propitiation there means the satisfaction. Um, it only occurs, helasmos in the Greek, right? It only occurs in the New Testament. And what this propitiation means is that he removes our sin. It's an expiation or a removal of our sins. So he is the propitiation, the satisfaction for the punishment of our sins and the one who removes it. He himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. What did John write in John 3.16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So God loved the world, so loved the world that he gave, gave his own son for the world. So he's just reiterating that here that he's not only the propitiation for our sins, but also for the whole world should people believe. Verse three, now by this, we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. You see, everyone said they knew Jesus, right? You had the, uh, the Gnostics said they knew Jesus. Um, you know, the Arian early heresy said they knew Jesus. 
Everybody says they know Jesus. But John's giving you a test here how to really know if they know him. You can't just be a hearer of the word. And you can't just be somebody who is speaking the word only. But as James said, we need to be doers of the word. So notice his criteria, the test for knowing Jesus. Verse 3 of chapter 2, Now, by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. Again, John is calling somebody a liar, right? He doesn't pull any punches. He's not saying, well, they're a little confused or they're a little upset or they're, they're a little misguided. No. No. He says, the person who says, I know Jesus and doesn't do what Jesus asks is a liar. Flat out liar. Liar, liar, pants on fire. That's really what he's saying. Verse 5, but whoever keeps his word truly, the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. So to keep his word is not only to know it, but to live it. And this individual, the love of God is perfected in why? Because if you know Christ and if you're living his word, then you're showing the world his love. And that love is perfected in you. You're, it's become a habit. It's become a way of life. There's a reason why the early church, the Christians, were called people of the way. They didn't always get termed as Christians. They were called people of the way because it was a way of life. It was a way of life. Verse 6, But he who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. You know, Jesus said, Learn of me. Right, that he is humble and meek, humble of heart. Learn of me. Look at the Gospels. We'll read them. We'll get into the Gospels soon enough. And when we do, we're going to see ways to live, the, the way Jesus lived. Um, to live for him and with him is to live in him and he in us. And so by doing that, we are sending a clear message to the world of the beauty of Christianity and the truth of Jesus Christ himself. <clears throat> Verse 7, brethren. First he says, little children, right? Now he says, brethren. Or, as some manuscripts would interpret that, beloved. You hear me say that all the time. Beloved. I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment, which you have from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning, from the very start of all this. Verse 8, again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. The true light is Jesus and the darkness of the pagan world, a world of confusion and blindness, John is saying, is passing away. And a world of God's light and God's truth and everything that comes with that, order, respect for the human person, um, peace, all of these things are coming. The true light is coming and the darkness is passing away, he says, because this light is already shining through us. Verse 9, he who says he's in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. This is another powerful statement. You know, John's theme throughout here is always truth and error, light and darkness, good and evil. That's right, Christ and Satan. It's always these opposites, these, this dichotomy 
because that's what he wants to show you is the real battle. It is the real battle in the world. And the person who says, I'm in the light, I'm walking in the light, I love Jesus, but they hate their brother, they have anger, bitterness, or resentment towards somebody who hurt them a long time ago. If that's you, you're in darkness still, even until now. It's a powerful saying. He who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. In other words, if you forgive and you have forgiveness and you love your brother, that shows me you truly do have the love of Christ in you. You have found it in your heart and ability to forgive, even if you don't feel all that yet, you still do it because you're a Christian. Because you know it's the right thing to do. I don't know if anyone out there today watching this is harboring anger, hatred, bitterness, or resentment toward anyone, family member, or friend. If you are, it is destroying you. It will destroy you. It is poison in your system. And you may not feel forgiveness in you at the moment, but you at least need to say it. Go to God and say, Lord, I forgive so-and-so. Even if I was in the wrong, Lord, I forgive so-and-so. Please forgive me from my bitterness, hatred, anger, or resentment. Now you do that doesn't mean you're automatically going to feel all happy toward them. But God hears you and God honors the fact that you have said that. And in time, the feeling will come. You just need to reach out and continue to do so. It's very important that we learn to forgive. Verse 11, but he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded him. Hate, anger, bitterness, resentment, all of these things will give you a blindness, a spiritual blindness, and you won't know where you're going. And you will walk in the darkness. And you don't want to do that because... If the blind leads the blind, they both fall into the ditch, into the pit. So I implore you today, whoever has anger, hatred, bitterness, or resentment toward anyone, let today be the day that you see the true light shine that you ask Jesus Christ to forgive that person, to help you forgive that person or persons. And he will forgive you just as we pray in our prayer. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are debtors to us. Beloved, these are the things of Christ. Never said it would be easy. But it is a joy to love him. Let him cleanse you of this poison in your system. That we might walk on in the light. That we might walk on as children of light. And that the Lord might use us in a powerful way in the lives of others. Now I'm praying that we're going to do that beginning today. We'll continue with uh, verse 12 of chapter 2 next time. But in the meantime, I ask that you would take heed to what I said. Forgive people and God will forgive you. Just say it. Don't worry about the feelings. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we ask that you would give us the will 
and the help to ask for forgiveness and to forgive those who have hurt us. And Lord, help us to shine as lights because of this. In a dark world, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we will begin in chapter 2, verse 12 in our next study. I ask you to read ahead, and I will see you again, same time, same channel. God love you.